May I call your attention to the reading of the word of God in Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. Reading from verse 8 to verse 11. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. I know your works, your tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and yet they are not, but a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of these things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death. And I will give you the crown of life. Father, bless the reading of your word to our hearts. Please, Lord, by your spirit, help us to appreciate and understand that which you are saying to the churches. As you say in these seven letters repeatedly, who, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. We want to thank you, Lord, that you are speaking to your church, even the church in Haberoni, Open Baptist. We want to thank you that you are still walking in the church and you assess. Thank you, Lord, that even when we go through reasons to cause fear to come upon us, you say, I know. I know, I know. And so, Lord, we pray that you minister to us through your word even now. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Today, I bring us again to Christ's letters to the seven churches of Asia Minor. This is so that the builder and owner and sustainer of the church may continue to speak to us with reference to this whole subject called the church, the gathering of his own people, the church. But even as he speaks to each one of us, because great is the task that he wants us to accomplish for him. White are the fields where he is sending us to go and harvest souls. Many are the opportunities for serving him. But if we have not resolved the question of persecution, tribulation, which brings fear in our lives, the mission that God has for us will never be done. Brothers and sisters, Last time, some time back, we looked at the first church of the seven churches, which is the church at Ephesus, which has been described as the fallen church, the loveless church, the careless church. The title of that message was, When We Lose Our First Love. What must we do? We must remember. We must repent. We must return. Today, we look at the church at Smyrna, which is described as the fearful church, the crowned but crushed church. But even for the greater context of the seven churches, there is a church at Pergamum, which was the faltering or compromising church. There is the church at Tyatra, which was the false church because it was corrupted. The church at Sardis was accused of being fruitless because it had become a liberal church. The church at Philadelphia was the feeble church, and the church at Laodicea was the foolish church, or the one that was self-satisfied, the one that was lukewarm. Today, we focus simply on the second of the seven churches that Jesus addressed in Asia Minor in the book of Revelation, as we have read from chapter 2. This is the fearful church of Smyrna, together with the feeble church of Philadelphia. This church is not rebuked, but commended and comforted by the Lord. What I mean is, of the other five churches, there were very stern rebukes that were given. But for the church at Philadelphia and the church at Smyrna, they are commended 
or comforted. Located 40 miles north of Ephesus, Smyrna was known as the Crown City. The name Crown City was really just symbolizing the hills that surrounded the city, this port city in a form of a crown. It was also known as the Flower of Asia because it was a very pleasant city to live in. At the time, Smyrna was a prosperous city. It was bustling and beautifully planned port city with over 100,000 inhabitants. It was famous for the production of myrrh, which gives the root meaning to its name. Myrrh is that fragrance which was brought to Jesus when he was born. And Smyrna was famous for the production of this very um, perfume as it were. As you will remember, uh, myrrh was extracted from the fragrant plants associated with death, and it pictures the suffering church. Myrrh was used for embalming bodies. So it is one of the important gifts that was given to Jesus when he was born. Of course, beginning to anticipate that Jesus was going to die. Very significant. But in this very city, there were many temples as well, including the temples that were dedicated to Zeus, the temple dedicated to Apollos, the temple dedicated to Aphrodite, but especially um, Asclepius was another temple there of the god of medicine. This was the god that was depicted with snakes around uh, this king and everywhere. But this is the same from which the field of medicine ended up using the symbol of the snake for healing because all kinds of beliefs were being practiced in that city to say if someone was not feeling well and if they were put, they were put in the temple of Asclepius where there are snakes and if snake, a snake would walk over them and not hurt them, they will be healed. A very famous city, a very prosperous city, a very rich city, endowed with even uh, the ability of those in the field of medicine. But the Christians who were there faced poverty in the city that possessed everything. Because of their faith in Jesus Christ, the Christians in Smyrna were suffering, suffering as it relates to their spiritual warfare and the imprisonment that they suffered. They were poor. They were excluded from the trade unions and they were lied to by their fellow Jews because they had refused to bow down to Caesar and proclaim Caesar as king. Therefore, the trade unions would not incorporate them. Hence, if they wanted to do business, theirs would be a tough one. The non-believing Jews, the non-Christian Jews who were in that place, they also hailed lies against them. And so they suffered in the midst of prosperity. They became poor. They could not uh, transact important businesses because they were segregated against. I, may I say even here, before I, I dig to the application, let's start to apply a little bit here. Brothers and sisters, you do not have to be doing anything that is wrong to be under pressure as a Christian. In fact, when you are doing everything right, that's when you might face opposition. When you are doing everything right, that is when you will face persecution and tribulation. You may be doing the will of God and crushing will come your way. But Jesus said that he knew their tribulation and suffering. He knew what they were going through. The word tribulation means pressure. And the word tribulation comes from the Latin word tribulum. Tribulum. But a tribulum was a stone, a rock that was used 
to press, to crush wheat so that you separate chaff from, you separate wheat from its chaff. You separate it by crushing it. And that's where you get the word tribulation from tribulum. That means these people, when Jesus says, you are in a prosperous city, you are in a place where everything is available, but I know your crushing, I know your tribulation, I know the pressure that you are going through. Amen. Amen. He says, I know it. If you are going to live a godly life in Jesus Christ, you will suffer. Even the city was famous for myrrh, myrrh which was to give out this beautiful fragrance. But for the fragrance to come, that too needed to be crushed. The leaves needed to be crushed before they can give out the fragrance. And that for me is very important. In Smyrna, the Christians were crushed. <laughs> they were pressed. They suffered. But as they were suffering, they gave out a fragrance offering to God. The church at Smyrna illustrates the vital importance of enduring in the Christian faith. We need Brothers and sisters, we need disciples of Jesus who can endure, who can hold on to their faith even during difficult times. Jesus said, he who endures to the end shall be saved. The Apostle Paul wrote, thus those who run the race must run in such a way that they win the prize. Brothers and sisters, the message he has for the suffering and fearful church is endure. To this crushed and fearful church, Christ comes and he describes himself as the first and the last. Look at that in verse 8. He describes himself as the first and the last. He says, I was dead, but I am alive again. Uh, wouldn't you be glad, brothers and sisters, that we serve a God who is not removed from suffering and death? He himself went through death. He conquered through death. Why? Because he is the first and the last. No matter what we may go through, if we go through this for his name's sake, we know he is in control. If he is the one who is from first to last, that means he knows what is in between. He knows what is in between. Praise the Lord. So he comes and he says, I know your affliction. I know your poverty. Yet he says to them, but you are rich. Did you see that? How can God say, I know your suffering, I know your tribulation, but you are rich? So God is not denying that there can be tribulation. He is not denying that there can be poverty, that there can be suffering. True, they are there. But you might have all of that when you are pitifully poor in the spiritual matters. But for them... The more they experience these external difficulties, they become richer, richer in their spiritual life. Yes, this is contrary to the church at Laodicea, which was materially rich, but very poor. Christ Jesus is giving a warning here that these people will experience prison and persecution. But he comes and he says, be faithful. Be faithful. How? Even to the point of death. Notice something here. He is talking of two things. He says, I know your tribulation, 
present, isn't it? I know the suffering that you are going to enter, future. <laughs> so I know your present suffering. I know even what is coming your way. Down the, down the line, you see, he even says, well, you shall even have 10 days of that tribulation. Both the present and the future, I know. I like that. I get comfort from the fact that God knows what I'm going through. He knows what I will go through. There is no surprise with him for whatever we go through. But the lesson of the church at Smyrna is very simple, but vital and timeless, by the way. He is saying, remain faithful in trials, endure to the end, do not give up. This lesson we cannot afford to miss or even forget. In this same city, perhaps you will say, well, who would have, who would have been able to live like that? In church history, we learn of some of the church fathers. And one of the church fathers who lived in the city of Smyrna was Polycarp. He is known in church history as Polycarp, Bishop of Smyrna. He was the last church father to have had personal contact with John the Apostle, the writer of Revelation. Polycarp was martyred or killed for his faith in A.D. 155. As his characters were leading him to the amphitheater, the officer in charge came to him and pleaded with him, urging him, Polycarp, please recant. What harm can it do to sacrifice to the emperor? It's just a pinch of incense and three words. You save your life. What harm? After all, you can pray to your God when you have gone. Just do it here. Polycarp refused to recant. To recant is to denounce the faith. He refused. But the appeal that was coming was, it's just a pinch of incense. And just the three words, they are of no consequence. And he says, mm -mm. perhaps at this point I need to say to all of us, beware of compromise in the name of it's just. Hello? It's just. Well, it's just a kiss. It's just a drink. It's just clothing, please. Don't be fussy for nothing. It's just this one time. That was the appeal given to Polycarp. It's just, it's just, it's just. We're just having fun. What's wrong with that? It's just. Beware of compromise in the name of it's just. But let's go on with Polycarp. Once in the amphitheater, the proconsul said to him, Polycarp, repent your years. Swear by the genius of Caesar. Swear and I will release you. Revile Christ and you will go free. Polycarp refused to recant. As they were tying him now to the stake where they were going to burn him, Polycarp told them, you don't have to make it too tight for I am not going to run. I am not going to move. So don't waste your time trying me hard. I have come here to give my life for my Lord. Why? He has been with me for the 86 years and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my Lord who saved me? That was his argument. I said, Smyrna reminds us that the fragrance will come when we are crushed. 
Smyrna reminds us that we have to go under tribulation. And when that has happened, the real wheat and the fake one will be separated. If persecution would come upon the church, how many of us would stand? Many of us would run. We sometimes even struggle to just do the things of God, to go and share the good news, or to go to a prayer meeting, or to come to church when you can even walk a three-kilometer journey. No, my car is broken. How can I go like that? Amen. It's just. Polycarp said, if God has kept me for 86 years, now I blaspheme him at the end of my life. Never. Paul reminds us that in uh, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 8 to 10, we are pressed on every side but not crushed perplexed but not in despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Christ so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. It is estimated that approximately 5 million faithful Christians were martyred for the faith between A.D. 64 and A.D. 313 the year that Constantine issued an edict that legalized Christianity, bringing a little bit of relief upon the church. Jesus' message is be faithful unto death. In other words, your faithfulness might actually lead you to the point of death. That's the calling that he is making. You're fearful. You're seeing all that is happening. Do not turn your back on the Lord. Remain faithful. Why? He says, I know. I know. I know. Are you willing to make a stand for Jesus like Polycarp did? Whose life is, is being impacted by your own testimony? We thank God for our brothers and sisters who are obeying the Lord through the water of baptism. Let your testimonies continue to impact the lives of others. What kind of works are you doing for the kingdom of God? Whose work is being made easier now because you are encouraging them or they are looking at you and saying, that's the kind of life I want to live. The people, the children of God at Smyrna faced poverty, persecution, hardship, and prison. They were crushed. Jesus said, you are poor, but rich. They were poor materially, but spiritually they were rich. The only way to get myrrh to give out its fragrance is to crush its leaves. The only way we are going to give praise to God is after you have gone through the pressure. In fact, Praise to God after experiencing pressure is more meaningful. Real praise is expensive. Praise when things are comfortable is not truly praise. It is probably motivated by the joys of the supplies that have come. But when you go through the crucible of tribulation and suffering, you are able to give real praise which is true and authentic. If you don't want to understand it, well, ask the woman with the alabaster jar. She came and poured that very expensive oil, perfume, at the feet of Jesus. And the disciples who were giving comfortable praise said, what a waste could have been used, sold, and we give the money to the poor. But real praise will come when you have been crushed. Real praise will come when you have seen that the Lord has walked with you even when things are hard. And Jesus said, you should be consistent. Whether things are right, whether things are difficult, be consistent. Do not be seasonal. Be a child of God who is faithful. I know you are hurting, he says. 
but I am with you. Remember that your self-worth is not connected to your net worth. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of the possessions that he has. What you have does not make you who you are. Satan can, yes, take your property. That is all right. But you need to have property that thieves cannot take, that moth cannot even corrupt. The devil may threaten to kill even your very life. It doesn't matter because you know it is no longer I who lives, but Christ lives in me. What then do you do when you are fearful? Three things. Appreciate Jesus' knowledge of your fights and fears. Appreciate Jesus' knowledge of your fights and fears. Nothing is taking him by surprise. He knows your current tribulation. He knows your future suffering. He is the first and the last, and he knows everything in between. Your struggles does not surprise him. Just stand firm for him, with him. Listen to what he says in John 16, 33. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Acts chapter 14, verse 22. Strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. First Peter 4, verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fairy trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Appreciate that Jesus knows your fights and your fears. That should give you peace. And he says, I know. Has God forgotten me when I'm going through suffering? He says, no, I know. Where is God when he, we are hurting? He is there, standing with us, walking with us in our midst. I know. Secondly, understand the purpose behind your pain. Understand the purpose behind the pain. It is true. God is not punishing you. God has not abandoned you. But your struggles are part of an orderly plan that he has put in place to let the fragrance come out. To make sure the genuineness of your faith comes out. Smina crushed in order to be a sweet smelling aroma. First Peter 1 verse 6 to verse 7 says in this you rejoice that is in your trouble in this you rejoice though now for a little while if necessary you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus. You see, God allows us to be tested in order to gain glory through the powerful work that he has done inside us. You see, verse 10 tells us that God knows even the extent of our struggles. Ten days. It's all part of God's perfect timetable for us. Ten days reminds us of Daniel three friends when they requested that they be fed on vegetables while others are being fed on meat and the delicacies that the king provided. Isn't it interesting that when they got fed on vegetables, I, I, let me say that I said this in the 8 o'clock service. Growing up in the rural areas, and when you have vegetables, no cooking oil, no tomato, just your vegetables and water and salt. It feels like torture. 
uh, say, is, is that all we are eating? Yes, mom says that is the food that is that we. Oh, okay. Ay, yeah, 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 yeah. You feel like you are in a furnace. But after 10 days, when Daniel and his friends were now assessed to say who is better, they were 10 times better than those who were eating spaghetti means, bolognese and whatever they were. And they were just going on vegetable. Meanwhile, the vegetable is like torture, torture. But that is good because when God gets through with you, you shall come forth as pure gold. He purifies us. He purifies us. True faith and yours. Not this simple faith that says, hey, things are tough, I'm out of here. Ah, ah. You were thinking you were on a, on, a, on a park walk. It's not a walk in the park. It's endurance. Hey, even when things happen in church and things are not too good, ah, some others are, yeah, they're going somewhere. Not there because, hey, don't, not me. You are looking for comfort. You will not find it. Don't just bring trouble where you are going. <laughs> don't just bring trouble where you are going. Because God will make sure that you go through smina. You will be crushed so that the genuineness of your faith can come out. Then Paul says, well, if you keep running away and going into different places, he says, well, we know you never belonged. That's why you went away. You never were there. The last one is aim for the crown beyond the cross. Aim for the crown beyond the cross. Understand, appreciate that Jesus knows your fights and your fears. Yes, understand the purpose behind your pain. But I want you to aim at the crown beyond the cross. Suffering appears in our lives as a cross that is ever before us. Perhaps even to cloud the cross that is behind. But well, before, without the cross, there is no crown. Without the crucible of sometimes being of suffering, you will not have the purifying effect that God is wanting to have in our lives. 1 Corinthians 9 verse 24 and 25, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain the prize. Every athlete has exercises self-control in all things. They do it. You know what? To receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable one. Isn't that beautiful? If Look at what the athletes, did you see what the box were doing? They massacred that team. They, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, some of you don't know rugby, do you? <laughs> they were amazing, weren't they? Oh no, you didn't even watch. <laughs> but they they put their bodies, you see those people being battered back and forth and some of them coming out limping to get a perishable wreath. And the whole nation is making marathons and runs in South Africa to rejoice for a perishable wreath. And we who are having to look for that which is imperishable, we are lethargic, we are indifferent, we are not motivated, we do not want to be all the things of God. What is wrong with us? That is the kind of Christian he is creating. He is wanting Christians who will endure, who will go, who will say, I will have to handle what it takes to be a child of God in a corrupt world. I will do what it takes to be a of God even when I am excluded from others because I will not cut corners. I will make a difference when everyone is saying everyone is doing it. I am not everyone. Be faithful. 
Why? Because yes, I know it may be difficult for me. I may not get the business. It's okay. It is the cross I am experiencing, but I'm seeing the crown behind the cross. That is what I hold on to. Young people, it pays to go through pain. It pays to endure. If you think things will automatically come into your head, they won't. You must study. It is the cross, but there is a crown behind. Parents have taught us to say, well, work now and play later. It is the crown behind the cross. Hallelujah. Hey, this one gets to me. Jesus said, I know your tribulation. He says, I know your poverty, but you are rich. As a family, as a church family, and as individuals, when we suffer, when we struggle, we need to fight those feelings of inner poverty and receive this reminder that we are in fact rich because in Christ Jesus we have peace, we have forgiveness, we have hope, we have promises. The life that was purchased for us on the cross is a wonderful richness. And only that true kind of wealth will satisfy. Only that true kind of wealth will last beyond the grave. There is no pocket in the shroud, they say. Have you accepted the treasure that lasts forever? That you must fight for it and be faithful to the end. Are you spiritually wealth in Jesus Christ? Do not fear. Be faithful. Amen. Amen. Father, I am praying. I come to you asking you, Lord, to forgive us of our indifference to faithfulness, our lethargy, my own struggle, Lord, even you know when I was preparing, I said, do you really mean it, Lord, that you know my suffering? You know even the suffering that is going to come, which has not yet come, and yet you say, be faithful to the point of death. I may not understand everything, Lord, but I'm praying that you give me help, you give my brothers and sisters help to be faithful to the end. To begin that faithfulness by really giving our lives to you totally. So that even if we have to face what Polycarp did, we may say, how can I blaspheme my Lord who has been with me all these years? Lord, to give our lives so that we can be able to give of our time, of our talents, of our treasures. So, Lord, that when even when we worship you, we do not worship you only in the manners that are comfortable, but even when it is costing us. For David said, how can I even bring before my God that which costs me nothing? Help us, Lord, to cross the boundaries because when we are crushed, the fragrance comes out. Help us, Lord, even in the giving of our tithes and offerings to not only give in the manners that make us feel comfortable, but in the manner that really says we are a fragrance offering to you. Oh God, there is more that needs to be done. There is more work that needs to be done. But workers are not found because we are seeking to be comfortable. Thank you for the believers in Smyrna. Thank you for Bishop Polycarp who stood. Thank you, Lord, that it is not only history, but it is something that can be done in our own time. A liberal society in a world that has turned its back on your word, 
and embracing secularism. Lord, we pray that we may find men and women who say we will be different as we remain faithful to our master. Even if it means we are excluded from certain privileges, we will be faithful. So, Lord, even as we continue our worship, we pray that you bless our time of giving. We will bless our time of witnessing those who are obeying you through the waters of baptism. For we pray and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.